Good evening, good evening. I'm Doug Handy. And I'm Abir Shanawi, and welcome to Real Talk Our Space. So it is good to be here on this Wednesday, the mm -hmm. 16th of September. And uh, for this episode, we're still in the month of September, so that means we still continue with our theme for the month, which is Brothers Gonna Work It Out. Brothers are still right. working. Brothers Gonna Work It Out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's why. That's why I have you. Thank you. As partner in crime. Thank you. So, um, so for the you know for this evening, um, if you notice, we have a pattern. Abir mm -hmm. and I are educators, so we certainly appreciate fellow educators. Yes. Our guest this evening is indeed an educator. He is a college professor, and you will see, um, and some of you may be familiar with him and his work. You'll see that his reach um, extends far beyond the college campus where he's employed, and really exciting because. Uh, Abir got a chance to actually meet our guest, right? And I know she was ex yes. so excited because remember she ran back to work the next day and was telling me <laughs> about it. So you want to talk about how you how you met our guest? Sure. I mean, I don't know if I ran back to work, but okay. Um, I did meet our guest at a conference in DC, a Societies conference. And I have to say, like certain people, you know, conferences are great. They're a great place to meet people. And sometimes I'm not going to lie, Societies conferences can be kind of boring. But when I heard this professor speak, I was blown away. Uh, not because it was, you, like you can tell, you know, he's got this New York swag, which always <laughs> you know, brings a little bit to the table. But what he was telling everybody was what we would consider real talk. And I don't think I've ever heard that level of real talk about mm. social studies and heavy hitting as to why we need to teach the subject and its relevancy to today. So for me, I was just blown away. And then I had the opportunity to actually speak to our guest one on one. And we kind of hit it off from there. And I was, I was super ecstatic because, yes, I did come back to work. And I was like, oh, my God, I met this professor and he's so cool. And we talked about this and we talked about that. And so, you know, so we've been quote unquote friends. I'm going to put in quotation marks, but I hope we are friends um, ever since. So I'm, Super excited. I'm fangirling. I'm always fangirling. My yeah, daughter's like, go ahead and admit it. Yeah, yes. I'm a fangirl, <laughs> fangirling that we have, you know, this professor on our show. So that's how we met. It was at a conference. And and he did say one particular phrase that always resonated with me that I tell people that I'm going to ask him to say it on the air because it's it really, really, that's the one thing that when I was in that conference, I was like, damn, that's so true. So mm. that's how we met. Very exciting. So I um, want to say good evening to V. Um, I see we have uh, v, hey, v Grant with us. Hey, mm -hmm. V. Getting us started in the comments. So that's a good reminder. Um, yep. Number one, want to say good evening to our audience as always. And thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you all. You helped mm -hmm. to make the show what it is. And uh, please participate and be a part of this evening's show. And also please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate everyone who's done that. And we ask that more people do it. Yes. All right. So why don't we get our official introduction? All right. <laughs> yes, I am. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries. So he is Associate Professor of History at The Ohio State University, where he teaches courses on civil rights and black power movement. Hassan was born in Brooklyn. New York and graduated summa cum laude from Morehouse College with a BA in history in 1994. At Morehouse, he was initiated into Pi chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, Inc. He earned a PhD in American history with a specialization in African American history from Duke in 2002. So now he's Dr. Professor Hassan Jeffries. Yes. Um, he is also the author of Bloody Lounge, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt, which tells a remarkable story of the African-American freedom movement in Lowndes County, Alabama, the birthplace of black power, which we'll talk about because I never knew that was the birthplace of black power until today. I was today years old. <laughs> we host a podcast, Teaching Hard History for all social studies buffs. If you don't know this one, you are missing out. Gotta get with it. That's right. A production of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Educational Division, Teaching Tolerance, and he regularly shares his knowledge of African-American history and contemporary Black politics with public through lectures, workshops, op-eds, and radio and television interviews. He also does appearances at different districts with that. In the classroom, Hassan takes great pride in opening students' minds to new ways of understanding the past and the present. And for his pedagogical creativity and effectiveness, he has received Ohio State's Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching, the university's highest award to teaching, and the Ohio State University's College of Arts and Sciences Outstanding Teacher Award, 
And lastly, Hassan resides in Columbus and enjoys traveling to the South to visit friends and returning to Brooklyn to visit family. We would like to welcome our guest, Professor Jeffries. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Abir and Doug. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for being Thank on our show. Thank you for show. being here. Yeah. Thank you for the Appreciate introduction it. and the kind words. We did meet in a conference. The National we Council did. Social Studies. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was. It was good. A lot of fun. And so. Hassan, she did run back to the office the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, true, true story. I mean, it's, it's hard not to when you have all that information and you meet such extraordinary people. It's hard not to share the love. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Very inspired. So, Hassan, we'll jump right into it. We have a lot we want to talk about with you this evening. Yeah. Um, so why don't we start with, uh, we know you grew up in Brooklyn, but before you, we get to that point, um, how about you share your family's migration story? Yeah, so my family's roots on my father's side um, go back, and that's interesting. Uh, well, let's see, my mother's side comes up through Virginia. Both, mm -hmm. both sides of the family were uh, enslaved. Uh, and so my father, my mother's side was enslaved in Virginia, um, early 20th century. Uh, they moved up to uh, Bristol, Connecticut, uh, mm -hmm. around World War wow. One. Uh, up that part, up in those parts, there was industrial work, mm -hmm. uh, and my great grandfather uh, led the family up there, uh, and so that's where my mother was born. Uh, Bristol now is known as the home of ESPN, but then right. you mm -hmm. know, it was, you find some factory work in tobacco fields, um, mm -hmm. and, and so that's where she grew up in Bristol, Connecticut. And then on my father's side, uh, my father's side of the family, the Jeffrey side. Uh, we're all, uh, we were enslaved in uh, Jasper County, Georgia. So wow. about two hours outside of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And, and there, you know, my father, my great grandfather, uh, born just with, a, with one foot in slavery, one foot uh, in emancipation, was actually able to acquire some land. Mm -hmm. um, but then he dies, gets killed, um, still uncertain what happens. Either way, around 1917, he loses his life and has to leave, <clears throat> or the family has to leave. Mm -hmm. And so my grandfather was just a young young child at the time, uh, just about seven or eight years old. He leaves and goes with my great grandmother and they moved to Akron, Ohio. So mm -hmm. Georgia up to Akron, Ohio. Uh, my great grandmother remarries, but then she dies within a couple of years. And so my grandfather uh, leaves Akron, Ohio uh, and is sent to live with his eldest sister. They had 12 wow. kids. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Aunt Bessie, so so uh, granddad goes and, and moves to Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and that actually, because he was the youngest at the time, there was this whole sort of all this family in Akron, Ohio, who I just mm -hmm. never knew about because, you know, there was this whole Jeffrey side in Newark, New Jersey and kind of in the tri-state area. Um, so my father and my, my, my father was born in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, and then him and my mother had met uh, at Central State. Uh, historically mm -hmm. black college uh, right here in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And then the, after they graduated, uh, mid 1960s, then they moved to Newark, New Jersey. They moved to New York, New York tri-state area. Mm -hmm. uh, and both were social workers. Uh, mm -hmm. And so my brother and I, then we then we came around in the 1970s uh, <laughs> in, in Brooklyn, New York. So that's that's how we got there. But I tell you, okay. the interesting thing, when I, when I came out and took the job here at Ohio State about 17, 18 years ago, my uncle, he was like, oh, I hear you're going, to, going out to Ohio. I was like, yeah. He said, well, don't be surprised if you find some family in your classes. Oh, and okay. I just thought he was, you know, I was like, ah, he's just talking mess, you know? And, and then sure enough, you know, about four or five years I was here, there's a young sister sitting in the front row, last name Jeff. Jeff Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, I said, you got, I said, where are you from? And she said, Cleveland. I said, well, where's your dad from or your mom? Mm -hmm. And she said, Akron, Ohio. And I was like, ah, oh, there you go. Wow. There you go. Did you know prior to that, that you had family from Akron or you discovered it when you moved to Ohio? Well, I knew, I, I knew there was family there, but I didn't know any of the family. Got right? it. Because mm -hmm. I was on that branch that sort of had drifted, had drifted mm -hmm. off. But my uncle had known all these connections. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was like, yeah, somebody's, like, somebody's gonna show up. You know, you know, mm -hmm. old, old, like, somebody's gonna show up. <laughs> right, right. I'm like, yeah, whatever, right? I, I, like, I know too much. Like, sure enough, she was there. And, uh, and then we made that family connection. Uh, my, my great grandfather was her, she was a generation below me. So my great grandfather was her great, great grandfather. Wow. So I mean, it was a real, you know, a real connection there. So that was pretty cool. That was, so my great, right? You migrate and you never know, you know, what branches you leave. 
So was your family history, this was your own research or was this already written down or was this something you discovered on your own? A little mix of both. Um, my, my uncle um, had, had done a lot of the research. I mean, a lot of this mm -hmm. was sort of passed down. Um, and, and we knew we knew the lines, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we knew how we kind of kind of got here. But then, what you wind up not knowing are well, what happened to the other branches, right? Well, where mm -hmm. are the kids, of the right. grandfathers, siblings? Right. And well, we we heard they went out to California, right? So all right, so who's in California? Right. Um, but then the, the then but then the the trail the trail sort of um, we sort of lose the trail the line when we get to about the eighteen fifties, right? Mm. I mean, which is the story of. Uh, descendants of enslaved Africans, right? It's mm -hmm. only so far you can go back right. Uh, right. before the records the records get cold and and you really literally get reduced to property. Uh, mm. And so we mm. can only we can only only able to trace mm -hmm. the eighteen to the eighteen fifties. Mm -hmm. But we we do know too that Georgia was uh, part of that Western migration. Mm -hmm. So the, the the folk who were holding my family in bondage had come from Virginia. And so okay. there was sort of a Virginia, you know, to as as there was to Alabama, mm -hmm. to Mississippi, to Georgia, kind of that frontier, if you will, uh, and then and then that's how our folk wound up there. Mm. That's that and y'all y'all hear how Professor Jeffries, you know, he's telling a story and he's also teaching. That's right. Time. So it, it, it has officially begun. And um, now you know why I ran to work that day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we've got comments already. Um, Me too. First of all, <laughs> love my, my, my girl from Tennessee, Michelle, thank you. I love you too. Uh, our boy, Keith, you're yes. an Ali fan. Professor yeah. Jeffries, yeah, we are, we're huge Ali fans. And Absolutely. this is our friend, Ev. Hey, Ev, thanks for tuning in. He's a big SPLC supporter and he's impressed by your panelists. Who would be impressed with uh, Professor Jeffries? <laughs> OSU, that's tough. I'm not, I'm going to keep out of this Ohio some, conversation. Some, some Michigan roots, perhaps. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. I don't, I don't he does, start, actually. Though. He does. And my sister lived in Dayton, Ohio for years, but I'm going to keep my, my comments to myself and let's go to our next question. So <laughs> we know your brother is Congressman um, Hakeem Jeffries. Mm -hmm. And I know, I, you know, I follow you on Twitter, Doug follows you on Twitter, and I love seeing your comments about to your mom about you know which son she loves more or whatever <laughs> tell us what it was like to grow up in the jeffries household <laughs> well it was interesting to say the least okay. um was it just two boys yeah it's just the two of us it's he's older boys. he's older he has ah. been about about by two and a half years and okay. it's, um it's quick to remind me that he is the older <laughs> the older sibling um and but but i think the the best way to understand our household mm -hmm. is is really to understand Kind of the, the the family dynamic so we had it was just my brother and i and we had a big extended family but mm -hmm. we didn't really interact with a big extended family mm -hmm. and so the major influences for us were our parents my mom and my dad uh and then my grandmother my mother's mother mm -hmm. and my and my uncle my father and and he were just two siblings so it was just the two of them as well and and it was interesting because my mom and my grandmother uh, were deep into the church, uh, mm -hmm. very heavy into the Baptist church. So we have this, so my brother and I grew up in the church, right? Like mm -hmm. Sunday school, uh, Sundays, you know, we tried to get out of Bible school on Wednesdays. <laughs> I mean, like we were all, we were all up and couldn't get out, right? Yeah. So we have this heavy black Baptist in Brooklyn church, right? Cornerstone mm -hmm. Baptist church, Corner Madison and Lewis. And then my, my uncle who was, um, Leonard Jeffries, who used to teach um, black studies up in up at City College in New York. Mm -hmm. And so he was very heavy into the um, black studies movement, Afrocentrism and the like. Right. And and so we had so on Sunday we'd be in church. But then on <laughs> Saturday, you know, my dad would take us, you know, hop on the A train and we go uh -huh. up to 145th Street in Harlem, Convent Avenue. And we hear, you know, John Henry Clark, Dr. Mm. Joseph ben Yakinen, right? Mm -hmm. and so we're, ten, we're eight, nine, ten years old, wow. sitting in these, you know, three, four, because these black nationalists, right? They don't, mm -hmm. they don't lecture for 20 minutes, right? It's like right. a five hour <laughs> lecture, right? right? And we're sitting there like, damn, man, we just want to watch the baseball games. Dad, right. no, you're going to sit here and listen to this. Like, oh, man. So we have, we got that influence. So we had that, the whole black nationalist, pan Africanist. Uh, my uncle actually took my brother and I to Egypt in 18, uh, in mm. 1986 for a major wow. conference. I was 12 years old, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, so, so we had the heavy sort of immersion in, um, uh, Pan-Africanism. Um, and then, and then my father was, and then, so both, and then both my parents were social workers. Mm -hmm. So we had this constant, you know, like, look, you gotta, you gotta, 
you got to do for people, right? Like it doesn't matter what it is that you do, right? Like we don't care. We support whatever it is that you want to do, but it's whatever it is, it has to be done for the people. And then the other little twist is that my father probably in the, in the early eighties, so I was, you know, 10 years old or so, eight or nine years old, he got heavy into martial arts mm-hmm. and it still does. My dad's 80, about to turn 83 now. Uh, and he's been practicing martial arts, um, uh, uh, for for forty years now, almost wow. forty five years now, and and so he got heavy into it. I'm serious, right? So, mm-hmm. so you know, as we were coming in, my brother and I both, as we were coming into sort of our maturity, um, and, and you know, moving in from adult, and you know, into adolescence, you know, we got the church, we got the Pan Africanism, and then we got this sort of you know Eastern um, philosophical approach, right? It's like, nah, you couldn't do anything because you know this. You, we walk in the house and mom is like, all right, you need to, you know, have you said your prayers? And dad is like, all right, you, you messing up nature. We're like, what was going on? Like, what's going on? No escape. No escape. No escape. But it was good because like, you know, we fast forward now and get to, um, you know, like, the, the, you know, your folk talking about eating healthy, right? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. you know, our dad was like, nah, you no processed food. Like, what are you doing? Right. You know, mm-hmm. like, I, you know, even everything, like I didn't realize like I had growing up in New York, not surprising, you know, I had uh, didn't have asthma, but I had, you know, sort of allergies and, you know, not surprising. So I had allergies and stuff. And then, you know, my dad was like, all right, you know, he's whipping up these concoctions. Right. Yeah. You know, pineapple juice and all this other stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I got to college and I discovered that there was medicine to deal with the allergies. <laughs> I was like, dude, you had me up in here suffering. You can pineapple juice in this hot ass house. Right? <laughs> I could took a pill, you know what I mean? Like, oh, damn. So it was a mix. I appreciate it, right? You know, I mean, uh, blood pressure's good now, but I'm like, man, I could have, you know, I could have used some clarity. <laughs> that's, that's too funny, I'm sorry. So um, is there a sibling rivalry between you two since you're on kind of two different paths? Yours can be considered political, mm. but his is a little bit more political than yours. Is there a sibling rivalry between you two? It's good natured, I mm-hmm. think. Um, it, he's know, not here to defend himself, so I will try to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's call me. I'll text him. Um, yes. <laughs> it, it, you know, he, now, it, it's good nature. We're both supportive um, of, of the things that we do. It's interesting, though, because like, we're also big sports fans, like all of us. Like my, my mother, not so. My mother could care less, right? Right. Uh, but my father, uh, my grandfather, my father and his brother, big sports fan, played play baseball in college. Uh, my grandfather was semi-pro, uh, you know, playing in the Negro Leagues, but the semi-pro oh, okay. stuff out in, in Newark, New Jersey. You would barnstorm, you know, when the Negro Leagues mm-hmm. came in, be part of those teams and stuff like that. So we grew up as big sports fans. But but it was it was interesting because my my brother, um, my father and I, we all root for different teams. So mm-hmm. so my my father, all my father's teams, you know, he's he's you know, it started with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Like all of it has like right. this, this sort of nationalist, like who had the mm-hmm. most black people on it, right? <laughs> teams, right. So he was he's a Dodgers fan. Right. The Dodgers had Jackie Robinson. He was mm-hmm. a Celtics fan, not because of Boston, but because of Bill Russell. Mm-hmm. Right. Bill mm-hmm. Russell in the 1960s and those teams. And then he was a Browns fan, a Cleveland Browns fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of uh uh Jim Brown, Jim right? Brown. Right. Right. 60s, mm-hmm. right. So those were those were sort of his teams. And then so my brother came along. And my brother took, you know, partly the rivalry, the rivals of my dad's teams, but then okay. also all New York teams, right? Because we mm-hmm. so he was a Yankees fan because my dad was a Dodgers fan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he was a Knicks fan because my dad was a Celtics fan. And, and wow. he was a Jets fan, the local. So all three. And so then I came around and I don't know why. I was just like, well, my dad has his teams. My brother has his teams. So I'm just going to choose my own team. So I just right. took what was left. <laughs> right, so like I had like the Mets, right? It was like it was rough, it was a rough childhood, right? <laughs> they weren't winning, it was tough, man. And then Giants, right? And then, and I actually, for the longest time, I was a Nets fan, right? So, again, because of rivalry, right? My brother right. had the Knicks, and this is this is tell right. you something. This is when I knew that he was going to be a politician, right? And I, this is some real, like, you know, younger sibling, older sibling. So, I'm about mm-hmm. eight years old, right? And he's maybe 10, he's eight and 10, it's two year difference. And I finally, I was like, look, man, I can't do this Nets thing anymore. <laughs> like, this is just too painful, right? Mm-hmm. So rather than just declaring myself as like a Knicks fan now, because you would go to, you know, I'm not gonna pick some random team, right? I'm gonna pick a hometown team. I go to my brother, I'm like, look, I can't do the Nets anymore. Is it okay if I become a Knicks fan? Like, I'm asking you. Hey, permission? Right, so, so serious, right? right? And he's like, <laughs> 
No. You should have been a Bulls fan. You would have had six rings. It could have been a Bulls fan, but Chicago too early, too early, (laughs) too early. So that was the one team, right? That that, you know, and with his permission, Mm -hmm. I was able to. I was able to pull for pull for the Knicks. But I think I mean I say I say all that to say big sports fans, but we all have our own you know sort of tracks and trajectories, right? So we always charted our own course, um, but always you know in a good way, right? Supportive of you know. If the Mets win, he's cheering for them. If the Yankees win, he's you know I'm happy that he's happy. Uh, but I still want my team to win, right? I mean, so it's always it's all it's always good. Eighty six well, Mets, yeah. the eighty six Mets, and then Adam Strom, who's from Boston, mm-hmm. he's been in the Celtics history with Russell, first black coach in the NBA, and real model yeah. for using his voice as an athlete and activist. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. so, so that answered that one question we had, of course, which is great. So, um, so you're since you're speaking of New York. Right. And you kind of touched on some of this already, Hassan, but tell us more about, you know, the planet of Brooklyn and how it's influenced yes. you. How how has growing up in Brooklyn made you who you are today? Yeah. Well, I mean, so Brooklyn, Brooklyn is interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we grew up, we sort of came of age in the 80s. Um, so I was born in 1973 and um, mm-hmm. in Crown Heights, Crown Heights section of Brooklyn, which is so I was in I was living in Crown Heights. My grandmother lived in Best Eye. Mm-hmm. And that's where our church was. So we were kind of mm-hmm. back and forth between Best Eye and Crown Heights. And Crown Heights at the time, Best Eye at the time, all black, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you had a, you had an infusion of, of folk from the Caribbean, all black, no white people. Literally, and, I, and I, this I don't exaggerate. Uh, with, there's a section in Crown Heights that is um, uh, Jewish, Hasidic mm-hmm. Jewish, right there. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but that's it, right? I mean, it, and it's sort of a tight enclave there. The rest is African-American and, and, and Caribbean folk. And so I literally grew up in a neighborhood in New York where for my first 18 years of life, I, I literally only saw one white person wow. like, like on like in the neighborhood. Wow. And it was, it was a white lady walking with a black child. And as a child of social workers, I was like, oh, that's a social worker. Right. Like, <laughs> wow. literally, like so it wasn't like a resident. Right. Like, it wasn't like a, right. random, like a random white person. I mean, other than you see police and then paramedics mm-hmm. and fire folk. Right. So, I mean, we think about segregation. I teach, I teach and civil rights and stuff like that. We think about segregation as being mm-hmm. a southern thing, right? It is no. There's, there's few places more segregated, right? Than mm-hmm. big New York City. northern cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. But then you can hop on a train, right? And then five stops away, you are in, you know, you're in Canarsie, or you're mm-hmm. on the bus, right? You're in Canarsie, or then you're in Bensonhurst, which is Lily White, right? Mm-hmm. That's Lily White. So, so my experience in New York, I mean, was two things. One, it was living in a segregated city. Uh, that was racially and ethnically segregated. Um, it was, it was there, were, there were some serious racial tensions going on, right? Mm-hmm. In the 80s, I mean, you, all, you had, you know, vigilante shootings, Bernard Getz, right? Mm-hmm. You had, you had mm-hmm. black, Yusef Hawkins, you know, a black folk who were being, you know, literally lynched, run mm-hmm. down and for entering white neighborhoods after dark. Uh, 1989, the year I graduated, my junior year of high school, right before I was about to graduate in 1990, you had the Central Park Five. Yep. Mm-hmm. So you had you had all this stuff that was happening to people, uh, young folk who were my age, right? So you got mm-hmm. segregation, you got this racial tension, you know, the police be police, right? So the police are doing their whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you throw in the crack epidemic. Mm. Yep. And it's like, man. And my father, I, I had mentioned that he was a social worker, but uh, what he did specifically, he was a drug counselor. And, oh. and so he did that in, you know, starting in New starting in New Jersey, Jersey City, and then he did it in New York, uh, uh, working mainly out of Harlem for you know two decades. Mm-hmm. And I literally remember him coming home sometime in the early '80s. Like right? this is before crack really hit hard, and he brings home. And you may remember like crack vials used to have these colored the colored caps. Mm-hmm. And so he brought home, and he and I, I mean I, I was ten years old, maybe nine or ten years old, and he sits my brother and I down. And he's like, look. And he, and he holds him up. And he's like, this is not candy, right? Mm. Like, this is what this is. And he said, it's coming and it's here and it's going to be a lot of trouble, right? So he was like, mm. you know, y'all stay away from that. And so, and he was right, right? But staying away wasn't just like, don't use it. Right. We now had to navigate, mm. you know, a new terrain, mm. right? So it wasn't just, you know, the, the thing that people don't understand or, or people miss about the the crack epidemic is not that it suddenly boosted the number of people who were uh, uh, using drugs, right? Like the, the the rate of drug use was pretty consistent throughout mm-hmm. the 70s, 80s, throughout the whole war on drugs, right? Like that's not that's not what made it so crazy. What made it so crazy is that it decentralized drug trade and drug mm-hmm. trafficking, 
right? Because before it was heroin, heroin was controlled in the 1970s, coming out of the 1960s, it's the Italian mob, mm -hmm. late 1960s, early 1970s, it's coming out of Harlem, right? Through GIs who are returning and they're, they're controlling, you know, sort of black mobsters in Harlem. Mm -hmm. So that's centralized. In the 1970s, you're starting to see, um, you know, more and more um, groups coming out of the Caribbean controlling heroin. Mm. In the 1980s, when crack hits, it decentralizes it completely. Right. So now you go from organized crime on sort of a large scale mm -hmm. street corner crime. Right. Yeah, and people yeah. trying to control corners. Right. And that's where the damn thing is so violent because people are trying to control corners. Territory. So by, territory. Right. And mm -hmm. young, you know, young groups. Right. Four or five, five in a crew. Right. And, and, and that becomes crazy. So by the mid 1980s, my brother and I, I mean, this is no exaggeration. We go to bed every night hearing gunshots on the corner. Mm. Like every night. Now there were worse neighborhoods, right, than Crown Heights by far. Like we were, it was funny. I th I thought we were, you know. So my in 1980, 1980, 1981, my dad and my mom they purchased a home. Like they, so we had been living in apartments, right? You know, we were on a third mm -hmm. floor. Grandma's on the second floor. In 1980, he was like, "All right," and he, he told me this later. I was like, well, "Why did y'all decide to get, you know to get a home?" And we just moved two blocks away. It wasn't like we moved in a new neighborhood, right? We really right. moved two blocks away. And and he was like he was like one you know it was an investment he like he understood mm -hmm. right this is the way you kind of put some squirrel some money away mm -hmm. and he said I had to get y'all I had to get y'all off the street and I was, like, oh. I was like I was like what do you mean was like we weren't doing anything he was like yeah I know but you were you were you were hitting that age where mm -hmm. you were start hanging out more right mm -hmm. and I wanted I, I, I he said I knew he said your friends were cool right like your friends on the, your friends on the black on the block were cool. He said, but I knew I was, I was, cause he's working, you know, as you know, as mm -hmm. social worker, mm -hmm. social, he's all the time. Right. So he was like, I needed to, I needed to break your friendship circle. This is what he said. I needed mm. to break your friendship circle so that y'all could then, you know, be home and, and stay in and stay inside. Okay. And we actually did. We had a little, little, you know, dirt backyard and, you know, he, he took some, he found some, uh, the old <laughs> green poles, you know, the street signs, right? Yeah. Built a little back, you know, a little hoop for us, my you brother. Find stuff all, the time. all the time. I always find <laughs> it, right? He just shows up with stuff, right? Uh -huh. So he, he found some green yard, 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 uh, uh, street, street poles and built this little, you know, hoop in the backyard. So it was, it was a decisive move because we never hung out like on the street after that because we had our own little space in the backyard. And then we have friends who were outside of the neighborhood. So when mm -hmm. we came home and like, you know, East Coast, New York, it's dark at 430. Mm -hmm. like, you know, we would just we just go to either to the backyard. Right. Or we just chill and do some work. Or we had our sports activities, which mm -hmm. were outside of the neighborhood. So we avoided literally. And, and this is, you know, psychologists will tell you, like, how do you how do people how do people survive mm -hmm. the young people? Right. And navigate and negotiate these you know dangerous neighborhoods. Right. Mm -hmm. tough neighborhoods. One, either they're outside and they're negotiating. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, or they avoid it. And what happened when my father broke us from that, from our friend circle, right? Mm -hmm. This is free cell phones, free, you know, you know right. so we could go past the corner, right? Mm -hmm. So you're two blocks away, you're in a different world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that actually, you know, we didn't take, we didn't bother, you know, sort of, you know, connecting with new people. Like we see cats on the corner, like, hey, but we were going to school in a different neighborhood, hopping on a train, Midwood High School was, you know, in, in, in Flatbush. Um, mm -hmm. So we actually avoided that corner drama which right. was really crucial uh, in just sort of helping us avoid extra stuff. But like I said, we were going to bed at night. You know, it, it was so routine. I, it's hard for me to imagine now. Like I'd be upstairs in the in, in my bedroom doing some, you know, algebra and I, you know, mm. hear some gunshots and then I go downstairs, you know, for a snack. And my dad, who was, you know, former Air Force, he'd be like, he said, you hear that? I was like, yeah. He's like, how many did you hear? And I tell him mm. like, I hear seven or eight or whatever. And I said, well, what was that? And he'd tell me, you know, if it was a handgun or something else. Wow. And then I go get some popcorn. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I'll see you later. And I go back upstairs, right? I mean, it was just that. <laughs> like part of the routine. Right. Yeah, it's it was your just, reality. It was just the reality. Right. Mm -hmm. just the reality. So, yeah. so that, I mean, that was, that influence, yeah. right? Like me growing up and just sort of seeing, like the other, the other component to that is like, all oh, that's my world. And then when I go to school, there's nothing I'm learning in school that's explaining my reality. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm getting nothing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what drove me to history, I mean, it could have been sociology. It could have been psychology is I was trying to figure this out. Like why? Like what is going mm -hmm. on? Uh, why is the world the way it is? Uh, and so and then New York had everything to do with that. Right. Like me trying to figure out what was going on.
So I think a, an extension, yeah. you know, that, I'll go with a beer. Continue. Oh, okay. When I was looking at um, Adam's comments, so Hassan talking about, you know, his upbringing yes. in Brooklyn. And then Adam Strom, shout out to Adam, who uh, was a guest of ours back in July. And actually that migration story came from um, the episode we had Adam on and really looking mm -hmm. at how Brooklyn was and then how it is today. So Hassan, I just wanted to share uh, this question from Adam. Mm -hmm. You know, what's it like for you to watch the changes today? Yeah, no, it's it, the changes are dramatic and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's uh, it's 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 both it's disconcerting and unsettling but in, in sort of very strange ways. Like, so when I left, when I left to go to college and I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, so I go South, right? Mm -hmm. Like my brother, mm -hmm. he goes to Binghamton, so he kind of stays in New York, but you know, he's upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I literally remember my junior year, like coming home one day and I was like, Lord, if you just get me to graduation, right? Like, please. I was like, I ain't coming back. And I <laughs> left, right? And I left, oh, okay. I, went down, I went down to Georgia, went down to Atlanta. And and people would ask me all the time, like, oh, don't you want to go back to New York? Don't you want to go back to New York? And I would be like, no, not really, not really. And like, I'm good, right? This is a different lifestyle. Like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, two things, like, mm -hmm. really sort of helped put sort of that New York experience into, into perspective. The first was one day, uh, you know, late 90s, I was just driving along, listening to NPR, because in grad school, that's what you do, right? You listen to NPR. <laughs> so I'm listening to NPR. <laughs> and they were talking about the homicide rate in New York City had declined. So this is about 97, 98. Right. And they were like, well, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it was, it might have been a thousand at that point, right? Like a thousand murders a year, which is oh, 700, 800, like, which is still a lot, but it had been going down. And then they said, well, the highest it had mm -hmm. been, um, the peak was in 1990, and it was 3,000 homicides that year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn. I was like, that was the year I graduated from high school. So you're talking about 10 murders in the city, in the five mm -hmm. boroughs every day? Right. Wow. And, and they, this had been going on for a decade. Right. A, a seven or eight years. Yep. And, and so when people were like, yo, do you want to go back into New York? And I was like, yeah, no, nah, like it wasn't it wasn't irrational. Right. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, right. it was like. And so, you know, fast forward, you know, another five or ten years, five years or so. I was actually I was actually participating in a workshop uh, down in Montgomery, Alabama for. Uh, the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson's uh, outfit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. he had a couple of us down there and I was one of the people who it's were talking. Program. Yeah, yeah, and this was, this they, they were gearing up, they were starting to think about doing the um, uh, the lynching memorial, right? And, and how to deal with this racial violence and stuff. So he had brought me down um, to talk about uh, racial violence mm -hmm. and racial terror. Oh, it's, it's actually, it had to be about 2009, 2010, the book was on him. And in, in, in Alabama, right, in the Black Belt. So I, I do my little piece and I talk about racial terror, racial violence. Mm -hmm. And then they had, and I forget the brothers, the gentleman's name, but he was a black psychologist who was based out of Harlem. And his, his clientele, he served um, African-American, prim primarily African-American men and, and young boys. And he was talking about post-traumatic stress from mm -hmm. growing up in these, these, high, 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 these, these very violent neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting in the back, I already did my piece, I'm kind of having lunch, kind of paying attention, kind of not paying attention. And then he starts talking about sort of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, right, as connected to living into the living in these cities. And he's talking, he's like, he's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's like hyper village vigilance and all this other stuff, right? And I was like, I was like, damn, like that kind of <laughs> sounds familiar. <laughs> familiar. But then I was like, but you know, I mean, when people have a diagnosis, right, they're always resistant, right? So I'm like, right. Yeah, that don't really apply. <laughs> and so and so I, I catch up to him. After. I was like, hey, you know, while you were talking, right, he was like, a lot of what you were saying was very interesting. I was like, because my wife says, like, you were describing what my wife says or how my wife describes me, like when I would go back home and we would go to New York. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she said, as soon as we get, you know, close to the George Washington Bridge, we were driving in, couldn't afford to fly. As soon as you get close to George Washington Bridge, you stop talking, right? And, you know, <laughs> you know, when you get to the house, you don't want to go out, you want to take me anywhere, right? All these cities, you know, sights to see, and you're like, nah, I ain't nothing to see. And, <laughs> and, and so I was like, look, that's just, that's just being in a New York state of mind, right? Like, you got to know how to get through New York. And, and so he was like, he was like, nah, nah, nah. He's like, that's not what it is. He mm. was like, and I was like, I was like, but that can't be post traumatic stress. I was like, I'm not like that anywhere else, right? So I was like, that's that's just New York, right? I'm just how you navigate through New York. Mm -hmm. And he's like, but you don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So he's like, so why are you doing it? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I was like, I don't know. And he said, because when you go back to New York, you don't go back to 2010. You go back to 1990, 
Mm-hmm. Right? Like you go back to 1980. Oh, yeah. You mm-hmm. do the things that you had to do to survive while you were there, right? Yeah. Your youth. Like mm-hmm. that's what the that's what the trauma, that's what the post part of the trauma is. Right, right. And so then I said, Yeah, you know, I'm still resistant, right? So I'm like, yeah, but I said, but my brother doesn't have any issues. <laughs> Like, like he, he's, you know, he stayed in New York, right? Like, no problems, right? He's New Yorker through and through. And then he's like, is your brother older or younger? And I was like, oh, I was like, he's older. And he said, <laughs> he said, he said, was he said, was he there with you the entire time you were there? And I was like, nah, I was like, he left to go to college when I was, so he said, when you were four, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, you were there by yourself trying to navigate this. Mm. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, he's like, you know, that's that's what it oh, is. That makes sense. You survive. Right. Yeah, he said, like, you survive, but you carry that with you, right? And so it, all that gets triggered when you go back. So when I when I so it only recently, right? Do I now go back to New York because it's changed so much, right? That you know, I finally have come to, you know, I, you know I'm okay with it now, right? But I still have, you know, I, I still slip into that, right? Like this is this is just how you have to be in New York, right? When I get in the train or subway or something like that. Um, but what's I think what's really jarring is I, I had said before, you know, I, I literally only saw one white person in my neighborhood growing up. And now I go back and I'm hard pressed to find black people. Right. Like the neighborhood has flipped, you know, completely um from from black to white. It is uh, you know, and, and the, the 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 sad thing is my parents are still there in the same house 40 years later. Mm. Mm-hmm held together with duct tape and <laughs> my brother and I to go to school, right? We stayed, we kept going to school and, but all their friends are gone because mm. most of their friends and the neighbors, they never own their own homes. Like you had, you know, New York, mm. people rented right. 35, 40 years. Mm-hmm. And then so whoever found- oh, I think it was very difficult, it's expensive. Yeah, very expensive, very expensive. Mm-hmm. If you own, like those who did own, got forced out because of taxes. Right. They couldn't, they, they own the home, but the, the, the value of the homes has skyrocketed and now they couldn't afford the taxes. Mm-hmm. So, so now you got, you know, my parents can go to the corner and get a latte, but they <laughs> have drink it with, right? Everybody go. <laughs> what, good is, what good is that? Yeah, yeah. I keep bringing up my friend Natasha, who is for, she reps Brooklyn Hard, which she said it's very different than when we came up, it's a new world. And I think a lot of cities, like, you know, I grew up on the South side of Chicago and where we grew up and you talk about gang activity or corners and my mom is right here listening and she would tell stories about how she wouldn't go to sleep at night until my brother came home because gang activity was so heavy then. Yeah. You know, we were Arab from the Middle East, but you had the Mexican rival gangs or black rival gangs or even amongst themselves. So that's a that's real, you know, that reality. And then when we go back to where we grew up, it's a totally different world. Yeah. And yeah. you don't you look back and you're like, that's not what I how I remembered it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's it's very interesting. So, um, so now that you you know are successful and you're a father yourself, so I'm sure you look at things differently. And what we have in common is we're both you know parents of girls. I have three girls. I think you have two. I have three. I have three. Three girls. There you go. So, and I have a you know my brother who's also a girl dad. So tell us what do you enjoy most about being a girl dad? <laughs> you know, what well, one is it's all I know, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's all it's all I know. Um, you know, and I don't know if there's any one thing. I mean, I just enjoy I enjoy them, right? Like I enjoy interacting with them. Right. You know, I don't necessarily have I mean, the thing was my brother has two boys, and, and I had said before I didn't ha- I didn't have a lot of ex- you know extended a fam extended family mm-hmm. that we grew up with. So I didn't really grow up around kids, mm-hmm. right? Like I mean, like in the house, right? There weren't a lot of kids around. And so I don't really have like my experience with children is now, you know, just like my girls, right? Mm. The stuff I picked up from my dad. So I'm like, this is just awesome, right? Like you know, <laughs> we can do now. What was what was so interesting, and, and part of it is, you know, I'm 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 a different generation now than like right. my my mom and my dad and the others, mm-hmm. right? And so you know, we have one girl and we have two, uh, and we had the second one. You know, th- this was also sort of the family thing, right? So on my father's side, right? So my brother had two boys. My uncle didn't have any, any children. My dad had two boys. So when I started having these girls, right, mm-hmm. in 2010, that was the first time in a century that my father's side had wow. whoa, and girls. Whoa, family, right? Like everybody else was married, wow. in, right? So, so the first time. And so then they were like, they were like, yo, like, 
So what do we do with them? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like you do the same thing you would like, what are you talking about, right? What do you do, right? Yeah. All of that is yeah. like the yeah. bias starts, you know? So that was most interesting, mm-hmm. just to sort of watch them. Like, you do the same thing. What do you mean? <laughs> so it's taken, it's taken a little bit, you know, for them to sort of relax and chill and be like, uh-huh. okay, 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 we get it. Like, there's no difference. It's like, no, nah, there really is no difference. And in fact, I love it more, you know. How old but are your girls again, Professor? The oldest Jeffrey? is right. So it's ten, eight, and five. Oh yes. So fifth grade, third grade, and and, and in kindergarten. But yeah. they're they're a delight. What what was interesting is I my my wife was in um, uh, med school, and she was actually overseas uh, in Dominica, and she's back now, but now in New York, right? So mm-hmm. there'll be long stretches. It'd just be me and the girls, right? And mm-hmm. you just just gotta do it, right? And it was it's so. You know, I guess as a historian, somebody I'm just observant of people. Like I just like mm-hmm. to watch people, right? Now I'd rather watch people than have people watch me. Right. So when you walking around, you got one girl in here, right? Because I used to have my little, I used to have my little strap, right? It was like mm-hmm. I have my little one in here, and I got one in the cart, you know, one behind me. I'm like, y'all, let's go, right? Let's we gonna do this. And the people would come up all the time, like, oh my god, like that's crazy, right? And then I would see moms with three kids, and people mm-hmm. just ignore them. Right, like, like it wasn't anything special or anything different. I'm like, I'm just doing the same thing that she's doing. Like, what's the like y'all in the way? They don't need to stop me and congratulate me for doing what I need to do with my. Right. So it wasn't. So I don't know if there's anything. I mean, it's like we make it special, right? Right. You know, we make it different. Uh-huh. Um, but and and it, and it's, I think because we live in a world uh, that is still so sexist, right? Mm-hmm. That we have to uh, be cognizant and aware of that. Uh, but I, but I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. They're great. Keith has a, a yeah. Keith weighs in. Up. There you go. <laughs> and they mellow you out. They mellow you out. You know, that's mm. so true. You need to speak to my husband because that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually had a post on Twitter. I'm going to put your daughter on blast in the door story. That was hilarious. <laughs> Slamming the door. So I love listening to your stories that you have with your with, with your children. They're they're very real. They're a lot of fun. They are. They are. Yeah. They are. So, Asan, you see, we, we like to jump around a little bit in your history. So we're going to go uh, back to college now. Yeah. Yep. Asan, the father, and I'm back to college. So Asan, like you, um, um, a proud product of uh, HBCU undergrad, uh, Aggie Pride, North Carolina A&T. There we go, Aggie Pride. Aggie, Aggie, Aggie Pride. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, just for the record, my sister went to Spelman, and she was there around the time you were there. And okay. I was close to going to Morehouse, so, you know. Uh, but I did go there quite a bit. Um I got a break. I go down to Atlanta, hang out down there. Yep, yep. Um, so really curious, though. So I, I went to a and I didn't go to grad school until later. I was teaching. I went part time. Wasn't on campus. I know a friend of mine, he went from A&T to Purdue for grad school. So just curious. Uh, in comparison between your undergrad experience at HBCU, uh, then you go on to a you know, predominantly white institution for, right. for grad school. I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two sides, right? Uh, two sides of the same coin. One is mm-hmm. So the academic side and sort of your preparation and what are you doing in the classroom? Mm-hmm. And then the other is the social side, which is important, yeah. right? So I went from, when I left uh, Morehouse, I, I, I enrolled, unlike you, I went right into graduate school. Okay. Right? I went right from undergrad to graduate school. So, you know, I was 21 years old at Duke University in graduate school. And I, and I show up in North Carolina and I had a scholarship at Morehouse. So I was always living on campus. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I had a fellowship for graduate school, but I was able to, you know, take that and get my own apartment. So I was like, oh, it's on, right? Like, like, it's like on and popping now. And and so I get up to I get up to Durham, Durham, North Carolina. And I had a homeboy who had is still a good friend of mine, wonderful artist down in North Carolina. Howard, shout out to Howard Kraft. Um, he had started at Morehouse, but then money got tight. And so he came back to Durham and he was finishing up at Central. Mm-hmm. And so and so I get to Durham, you know, I get on the phone, like, Howard, I'm up here, man. He's like, all right, we're just gonna kick it. And so like the first, you know, so, so Duke and North and Chapel Hill are so close, right? Yep. Yep. So it was like, like the first week, like we went out, we hit a couple of parties and stuff like that. I was like, great. And then like the next week we went to like Chapel Hill and we hit up all our Chapel Hill parties. And then the third week we went to kind of a mix and we were like, damn, these are the same people. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, by three weeks, we had met all the black people, right? Like who were either, you know, you know, just finishing school, you know, undergrad or, you know, law school, you know, just in that. And I was like, that's it? Like, this, this, this is over? like what do y'all do for the rest of the year? And so I was like, yo, how are we? I go back to Atlanta, right? 
And so <laughs> that was that to me was the big difference, right? Mm -hmm. Like the social circle was so small. Mm -hmm. Right. In Atlanta, and you got the AUC because you had more else, you had Spon, oh, yeah. you had Clark, right? I mean, Clark. it was, it yep. was huge, right? And and so that was I was like, man, like y'all got it rough up here, right? Like, <laughs> and so which was, you know, in a way it was kind of good for me because you know, I was ready to already transition to the serious mm -hmm. work doing graduate work, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, ah. So I actually wound up probably hanging out as much with my man Howard at Central, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with you know the, the Eagles, right? You know, that, right? The, oh yeah, we, we know them well. <laughs> you know, yeah, right? uh, as much as I did with you know hanging out with people at Duke and Chapel Hill, right? Mm -hmm. because I was like, man, so you know, the, you know, predominantly white just 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 ain't that many, right? Was, right, <laughs> right. So small, but the cool thing was I felt really prepared. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I, mm -hmm. when I came, when I got to graduate school, I was like, like I didn't need it. I didn't need any coddling. Right. I didn't need any like, hey, this is how I was like, all right, let's let's do let's go to battle. Right. Like, yep, yep. I, like I came out ready ready to go to war. Now the only the only thing, and I've discussed this a lot with uh, my friends who uh, came out of Morehouse. Because the whole this was like a ten year period uh, mm -hmm. where from like 1989 to 1999, mm -hmm. and I graduated in '94. There's about a 10 year period in there where there are now, I think, I think the number now is like 15 of us who went on and got PhDs mm -hmm. in, in history or in African studies or in black studies, right? Like mm -hmm. 15 from this little, you know, little yep. college, you know, I mean, all in and all, and almost all of us now are in higher ed, right? So mm -hmm. we're like, man, so what was going on while we were at Morehouse? Like something, you know, in the that drew us to Morehouse in the first place. Right. And then sent us on this particular trajectory, but the one thing, the one thing, because Morehouse was small. I mean, the history department mm -hmm. was like six six people, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. really small. so you couldn't have a lot of um, specialization, right? Okay. Right? So there was no course on the civil rights movement like I teach now, mm -hmm. right? There was no course. You know, I'm teaching a course on the civil rights movement. I'm also teaching a course on the last fifty years. I was like, I'm going to teach a class called the last fifty, right? I'm just making <laughs> stuff up. <laughs> like you couldn't do that at Morehouse, right? right. You, you had to teach, you know, U.S. history, like nine sections. Of Basics, it. yep. <laughs> yeah. right. So you couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. when I got to when I got to um, to Duke in the graduate school, you know, like I like I had thought about a lot, but I hadn't necessarily read a lot in terms of monographs specific to subjects because mm -hmm. those gotcha. classes, you know, we're not taking a class that had. You know, you would you just sat and read for 15 books on a special topic mm -hmm. that just mm -hmm. didn't exist. And so when I got there, it took me a while to catch up just in terms of the historiography, in terms of reading. Right. In terms of just just having that breadth of, of knowledge in terms of what we had read. But what I had learned in terms of critical analysis, in terms of critical thinking, in terms of media literacy, in terms of just looking back at, at, at documents and being able to like that ain't right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that more house prepared all of us, right? So when we walked up, we walked up in there, we're like, Yeah, I don't know that book, but I know it's wrong, right? Like, <laughs> you know, and so it was it was a different kind of preparation, but we nice. were prepared, we were prepared for sure. Excellent, excellent. And I really appreciate that because um, you know, um my initial degree was in engineering before I got an education. So the front I told you about engineering major, but it's really very, very similar to what you talked about, you know, being prepared, being ready to take things on once you got up there. And uh, shout out to HBCU. So I just gotta, you know, always gotta give HBCU love. You know, the folks know like great products and you know historical institutions. You know, Morehouse. You know, institution, legend, legendary institutions. So shout out to all that. Yeah. Love it. So we're talking about history, and my favorite part, which I love, um, this website. I love this organization. I love everything about it. So tell us how teaching hard history came to fruition. Um, and I love the title because it is hard history and. So I'm going to ask you two questions. How did it come to fruition? And then can you explain to the public your famous quote that you said at the conference about when the students come to you as opposed to us and their emotions? Oh, yeah. You know yeah. What I'm talking about? Yeah. So you have to share that one because that's something I always run with as well. So gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Mm -hmm. So um, Southern Poverty Law Center uh, and mm -hmm. Teaching College is the division of Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they had reached out to me, you know, early 2010, 2011, uh, when they were doing a sort of state of the field, uh, for civil rights, mm -hmm. they, they had done two reports, 2011, 2013 or so on, um, looking at and assessing, uh, state, um, curriculum, uh, and state mandates for teaching the civil rights movement. And then they just had reached out because they were familiar with the work that I had done. 
I said, hey, could you, you know, could you review, you know, the, the report? And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I was happy to do it and, and, and did that. And so that started sort of a working relationship mm -hmm. uh, uh, of just sort of, you know, partnering with them and, and basically what the work that they were doing. Right. And then they reached out, you know, three, four years ago and they were like, hey, you know, one of the things that we realized uh, as they were conducting this research about why we were teaching civil rights so poorly and why students were learning civil rights so poorly is like uh -huh. they weren't getting slavery. Like they just mm. had no idea. Slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, right. it was like just, it was, it was backwards, right? Like they didn't understand it. They weren't getting it. They weren't teaching it right. And then, so they couldn't teach civil rights, right? Correct. So they were like, hey, you know, we want to develop these uh, frameworks, right? Let's see if we could develop a framework for how to teach this history uh, both accurately and effectively. Um, and would you like to be a part of, you know, what, what, what we're going to do? And I was like, yo, sign me up, right? Like this mm -hmm. is, um, I ain't got no time for it, but sign me up. <laughs> we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. And so shout out to Kate Schuster, who is an independent contractor uh, who works closely, been working with Southern Poverty Law Center for 10 years or so. And she really dug deep into um, developing the framework, brought on a wonderful team of scholars. I chair the advisory committee. Um, uh, so the, the, the larger team of scholars that came was like, all right, this is what we need to focus on. Let's put the emphasis here. You know, what might be the 10 key framework, you know, 10 key points um, that we should focus on. And so, and so we came up with that and, and then, you know, so I was like, oh, great. We had, we, we came up with a fantastic curriculum, you know, started adding to it with resources and the, the original iteration, it was going to be, uh, is really kind of for high schoolers. And then, and then we knew that we, we would expand it out. And so we did that last year sort of yeah. for, you know, K through 12, well, first through five and then, you know, middle school. And, but the, but the podcast was interesting because they were like, they said, hey, we want to have a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, good. Good for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, well, it was like, well, we want, we want, we want you to host it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, I, I said, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm looking, I was like, I got all this other stuff to do. Right. Like I, I got to take care of these kids. Right. I ain't got time. <laughs> And I said, it's like, no, but it won't be very much, right? And I was like, okay, famous last words. Like, I <laughs> thought I was just going to have, like, all right, you give me a little script, right? Like, I read three sentences, right? And then we be done, right? Uh -huh. Oh, right? Like, no, this is, like, we got to have these stories that introduce the content, right? Then you're going to be interviewing people. And all. So it just, so, you know, I kind of, yeah, I wasn't looking for it, right? And, and, but they, but it was a good extension of the work that we have been doing. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm so glad. I mean, you know, as soon as I hop off this, I got to write an intro for another episode, right? Tonight. So the work continues, but it's good because I'm still surprised about how many people listen to it and, and they, they pick up great stuff. But you also do the intersection. Like you did one with Renee Goki, who's a, a colleague of mine, because I'm also teacher advisory for the Native American Museum. Oh, nice. And you do the podcast of, uh, the idea of enslavement among Native Americans too. Yeah. Like these are ideas that people don't think, they just think, you know, white and slavery, but they don't put the other concepts together. Yeah. And you start yours out, of course, with um, your uh, your visit to Madison's house yeah. and how that all came together. So, and what's the famous quote that you always say that really gets people because it's true? Yeah, so, okay, if, if, if just, just if, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say what I think you th what you think you're asking me to say, but if I'm not, just like nah, ain't it. Okay. But anyway, so um, it's it's you know it's about teaching it's about teaching the kids, right? Correct. And and if we're like the the students I get at Ohio State, mm -hmm. um, when they come into my classes and we're doing civil rights and we're doing especially if we're doing sort of a survey like African American history through film, which is going to take us from slavery up into the present, and we come in. And, and, we, and I start dropping this stuff on them. And a lot of times I can't actually, like, I have to use other voices, right? Because, right. you know, I got to use primary sources. I got to use media, right? Because if it just comes from me, they can dismiss it. Like, oh, this is right. a black guy, right? Like, what does he know, right? <laughs> so I got to use other voices until I can get them up to the point where they're like, yo, is this right? And I'm like, yeah, it's right. <laughs> and, and, and it happens quickly, right? It don't mm -hmm. take long, right? They start seeing this stuff. And they're like, they're like lynching. Like that's a thing. Like you mm -hmm. mean black people were just randomly murdered and nobody went to jail and that's the people who did it. And now nobody's wearing a mask. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And they're like, damn. And so what happens is literally they start going through the five stages of grief. 
right? Mm. Yeah. Like first yeah. is, you know, it's just that, that that's not true. That didn't happen, mm. right? It's this, it's this disbelief and then it's skepticism and then it's like anger, right? And then it's grief, like, oh my God, what can they do? And then finally we get them to the point where like, all right, like acceptance and then action. But, but the anger thing is what's most yes. interesting. Mm. Because when they get mad, people say, like, oh man, they must be really mad. You know, at mm -hmm. you, it's like, no, nah, students in the class get mad, right? They get mad, you know, mad for not knowing, right, yes. this history. But wow. they don't get mm -hmm. mad at me, right? Like, this is what I was saying to the teachers there. I was like, they yeah. get mad at y'all, right? Yeah. Because they're like, Miss So and so, right, in eighth grade, never taught me this, right? Like, what was up with that? Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean that, that and, and then next thing you know, I'm winning teaching awards, right? For telling them <laughs> for telling them basic American history, right? Exactly. And, and, and that is and so my thing was like, look, you don't want to be the teacher who they're mad at. Right, right. right. Like down the road. Mm -hmm. You want to be the one who, and I get these two, right? Who will come in and be like, yo, Miss Abir taught me this, right? And and this started yeah. me out. So you're and, and I get that too, which is great. Mm -hmm. Not as much as I would want. But they tell me what they did in that history class or that government class or that one teacher in social studies who was like, you got to check this out. Yep. And then they want to build on that. Right. So you, you want to be you want to be the teacher who's remembered for the right reasons. Right. For, 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 for teaching them some truth, even if you don't go into great detail and depth, just letting them know that there's more out there than mm -hmm. these myths and misconceptions. Yeah. And, and when you said that at the conference, you could see people's faces going, damn, he's right. Mm. Because you know, when you said they're not mad at me, they're mad at you. I was like, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that with the framework that you're doing K through five, it's it's very powerful because, and I remember seeing Jason Reynolds, the um, famous author who did the remake for, for Stamped. And he talks about how in Germany, they teach the Holocaust from kindergarten. They don't sanitize it. And that's the same thing with slavery. Kids should not have to find out about it when they're in fifth grade or in eighth grade. This yeah. is part of history. We really need to introduce it to them in a, in a reality, like you say. So they're not mad at us when they find out from you. So, <laughs> excuse me, that's my favorite quote from you, by the way. Yeah. She's, she's been waiting on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hassan, I just want to go back to the, uh, you know, teaching hard history. So uh, recently I listened to the episode, episode, episode three, uh, mm -hmm. Playlist for the Movement. Yeah. And it was on a Saturday. I was running some errands. I just couldn't wait. So I, I spread it out over a couple, you know, um, bits and pieces of lesson. I just couldn't wait to get back to it. So just, just the engagement. Um, yeah, you had uh, with Dr. Hughes, Charles L. Hughes yeah, on there. Charles Hughes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just the way you all chopped it up and talked about, you know, especially the part you talked about, you know, we talk about lyrics, but then, like you said, just the music and the energy of the music and the, the Little Richard and Pat Boone. Yeah, so awesome. it was it was amazing. So I just um, mm -hmm. I'm so and and like you know, Bear said, anyone who hasn't been listening to the podcast, you you got You got to make it happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. I'm yeah. glad. You know, so th so this season we're doing the third season now. And this season is on the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's connected to, I edited a book that had just come out, Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement came out last fall, last November. And so what we did for this third season, as we're sort of building up, you know, we did slavery for the first two seasons. And the second season, we had that heavy focus mm -hmm. on um, indigenous enslavement. Mm -hmm. And then and this season, we're focusing on civil rights. And so that third episode, uh, you know, and, and, and when we were, like, I was thinking about, you know, three years ago when they were like, hey, you want to do a podcast? I'm like, yeah, I'm also doing a book. We're going to do this on civil rights at some point. And I was like, we're going to do it on music. We're going to have my man Charles Hughes. I mean, I literally have, have been thinking about this episode, right, for three years because music was so central to the movement. And he, has, and he just understands it so much. You know, he does these little, uh, we also have Charles Hughes. He teaches out in Memphis at Rose College. And he does these sort of um, um, uh, short little, you know, five minute segments, right? Like mm -hmm. we did each episode for this for this season. And he did this first one in the first episode. That's just fire, man. And he was like, he was breaking down Janet Jackson's um, Rhythm Nation, right? <laughs> he, he was like, he was, and I was sitting there listening to it. I was like, damn. Right? I mean, was like, this is how it connects to freedom and this, and this is why, you know, I was like, whoa, Rhythm Nation? I was like, that? <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah, he yes. gets into it. Yeah, he's oh, he's, he's, I was like, I mean, it was, and it made so much sense. And then he, yep. he said, and he's like, so this is the bridge, and this will take you to, you know, Beyonce and Lemonade and, and Kendrick Lamar. And I mean, I was like, man, and so, and, and so music is so central. So we, we, we talk, mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, sort of central issues to civil rights, but it's all about teaching, right? And you can't yeah. do this stuff uh, without music, right? And so right. being able to draw music into the classroom is so, 
so important and and, mm -hmm. and it provides a bridge to connect to our, our kids too of all ages yeah yeah you all talked about that they yeah. talked about right students you know centering your students showing them that you honor and respect them how they feel yeah. um just by listening to their music and we had um you know, I think we had some guests on earlier. We had like a like a hip hop show talking about some of this. So just the connections were really right. really powerful. Really appreciate that. Right. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the work that you do to, like you said, to make sure you fortify things at the K through 12 level um, while you're doing your post secondary work. So along those lines, I had a question about. Um, I know you consult with school districts. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. So just curious, like what are some of the successes and challenges that you've experienced? You know, while doing this consultation, these consultations around developing anti racist programs. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, you know, I can tell the. You know, sometimes I get I get calls right, and I pick up the phone, and I, and I may be talking to a superintendent for a district, and they'll be like, "Yeah, we want you to come in and just like speak for you know an hour or so." And I'm like, "Okay, well, what's your plan after that?" Well, no, that's it. And I'm like, <laughs> I, "Like, I I don't have time for that, right?" Like, <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah, it's like yeah, no, because y'all are serious, right? Like y'all, yeah. that's not serious. Right. It's not there's, there's nothing I can say or do right mm -hmm. within 60 minutes or two hours. Right. Or even a full day. If that's exactly. all you're going to do, right. Right? Yep. If that's all you're going to do. So like before we even get to sort of the successes or the challenges, it's like, you know, where people are. Mm. Right. One, depending upon who's calling. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, is it the superintendent calling? Right. Or is it, you know, a teacher who's just like, I need help. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Because then you got to, you know, you know, is you know how much of the district is behind the effort. Right. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. You can tell a lot just in that first conversation. And then what are they asking for? Are they just they just trying to check a box or right. are they serious? Right. And then, you know, the real serious people call when they call. They're like, look, we want you to talk to teachers. We want you to talk to students. I'm like, OK, good. Like, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, we can do that. But then we also want to we, we, we need we need to, we need to talk to you about our curriculum. Like that, mm -hmm. now, hey, that's what we're talking. Right. right. Yeah. So when yeah. you get to the curriculum. Right. Because that's lasting. Right. Your teachers. Yeah. Even if they're there, right? I mean, that's just one classroom. But the curriculum is so, so, so crucial because you got to scaffold that, right? You want to build mm -hmm. it up, and you want to build it out across the curriculum. So that's what we want, right? Like we want to get to the point where we're talking about, all right, can we can we develop a new class, right, mm -hmm. on the African American experience, right, mm -hmm. uh, as an elective or as something that's required, right? Like that's that's in the end that becomes to me the success. Now right. I can't point to too many of those. Um, mm. You know, but people are wow. still, people are still, you know, um, people, people, are. St this is a moment, right? The moment that yeah. we're in, you know, the young people who have taken to the streets mm -hmm. and God bless them all have created space for us as right. not only educators within the classroom, but mm -hmm. as educators to push our districts um, to say, look, you know, they, the, they are demanding this, right? That we mm -hmm. teach this material accurately and effectively, that we teach the truth, mm -hmm. but they also deserve it. Right. And, yeah. and we got to do it now. Mm -hmm. And so it's been good. It's been a busy summer because more and more folk have been saying, hey, we, we get it now. We're here. Now, mm -hmm. let's, see, let's see if we can do it. Um, and, and some are like, look, look, we're trying to long haul this, which is great, right. which is mm -hmm. great. Some, yeah. some are still but some are still like we're trying to check a box. Right? It's a huge mind shift, too. I mean, it's all this fragility that people are taking into place, a lot of performative yeah. you know, functions going on. So um, I'm happy you're saying that it's few people that are going out and doing it. Cause then, you know, people can look at everybody else and say, okay, are we doing the work and what are we doing as well? But Doug and I always ask other people as well as like, well, we're happy it's happening now, but why now? Because teachers yeah. of color have been saying this for decades. Right. Right. You know? right. 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 So it's just interesting to see the shift, but I like how you phrased it where, you know, when people are serious and when people are just checking a box. Yep. Right. And a beer is interesting. Cause you know, professor Jeffries is on the, I guess the other end of what, a beer and I see, right? Or somebody will say, oh, we brought in, you know, Professor Jeffries. Right. And it's right. like, you know, everybody will come around, they'll, you know, check out your bio, like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. right. And then next thing you know, you're, you're back to, you know, right. what you got to do next. Oh, yeah, right. we're sitting there like, you know, right. right. So, yeah. um, right. Okay. So we know um, along those lines. Right. You got uh, that new book coming. So I, I'm excited about the new book because, yes. um, the way I'm looking at it, it's got to be some 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 hip hop in there and whatnot. So uh, and I'm thinking, right, you and I, we come, you know, we were just a year or so apart. So I'm just um, I, I love the way it's going to connect. Like you said, mm -hmm. it seems like it's going to really connect, you know, what's seen and not the distant past. Right. Which kind of right. sometimes we forget. 
But uh, just curious about when that book's going to come out, because I admit I was looking about it. I was researching. So any, any yeah, yeah. timeline on the book? No, no, no. It's still, I'm, still, I'm still in the heavy research phase. Still okay. Still the interview. So you got to be a little patient on that. Yes, right? sir. Yes, sir. I can, I... The, 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 the impetus for it is, Doug, is exactly what you were saying, right? Like, it's been 50 years since 1970, right? That's mm-hmm. half a century of history. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's no longer it's no longer acceptable. It never was. But we can't go from like John Lewis to mm-hmm. uh, Barack Obama and think that we've covered it. Right. right. Like, like that's right. you. You haven't. What you've done is you've jumped over. Right. Um, and 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 it's also insufficient. Like as historians, what we have actually done is we've actually ceded the last half century uh, to sociologists and to you know, uh, uh, scholars who study cultural experiences. Mm-hmm. And so hip hop becomes sort of the primary uh, vehicle through which we understand the black experience in the last quarter of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, that's a useful frame. And mm-hmm. we should look at it as one frame, but we can't look at it as, we can't look at the entire experience and analyze it solely through that frame. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. like you wouldn't do, you know, you know, through any musical genre, try right. to try to understand and explain the entirety of the African-American experience. You get that provides you a window and a snapshot and it has to be put into a broader context. Right. And so that's one of the things I want to do. You know, hip hop is the thread, right? It's one of the threads, but it's also, you know, you got in the 1980s, you got, you know, uh, uh, black student activism, like throughout mm. New York, high schools mm. and colleges connected to anti-apartheid work. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Like there's so much going on. Um, you know, both good and bad. Like how, you know, how does, what we were talking about earlier, my own experiences in the 1980s, oh, yeah. right? You got to deal with the, you know, the changing, the changing uh, drug trade, right? Like yeah. how does that impact, you know, the rise of mass incarceration, you know, AIDS and, and how does that mm-hmm. impact the African-American community mm-hmm. and the pushback that we get within the African-American community, right? Like, you know, the, you know, black folk are inherently, not inherently, black folk are traditionally conservative, right? Mm-hmm. And so, Part of you know part of the problem uh, was not only at the the state level, right? With Reagan pretending that it didn't exist, but it's also the African American community not willing to deal with uh, the you know, acknowledge and recognize that they're gay folk in the African American community, right? Right. right. Like, this is the 1980s, ain't no gay marriage, right? Like they, you know, you don't even want to acknowledge the organist, right? I mean, it was. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. it was that deep. And then it has those real ramifications and implications, right? I mean, people are dying because of our own ignorance, right? So okay. trying to, you know, weave all these stories uh, together uh, is, is what I'm setting out to. And, 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 and framing it from, so late 1970s. Uh-huh. Uh, so, so literally the book begins uh, when, uh, in 1977, after the blackout, the major blackout mm-hmm. that happens in New York City. So literally when the lights go, the power comes back on, that's when the book begins. And then I take it to the election of the defeat of David Dinkins, first African American mm. man, mm-hmm. and the election of Rudy Giuliani in 1992, 93, because that sets New York on a different trajectory, yep. right? And so mm-hmm. that that you know, if I get time, you know, the, the next book will pick up that, that second half. But you know, this sort of 1980s and bookending is is, is what the story I'm trying to tell. Wow. So so you, I'm sold, right? I, I got to get my pre order right <laughs> because mm-hmm. Hassan, I've told a beer this, you know. Um, never was the best student of, of history. And for me, you know, I'm, everything you said, you know, going through like K-12, never really had a history teacher. I remember at a, in high school, it was a teacher was really going hard on black studies. And I just I wasn't ready. Right. Yeah. And then I get to college and I start the same people you named, John Henry Clark, yeah. um, like going to lectures and seeing yeah. folks come on our campus. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? I missed all this. Mm-hmm. But then the class I remember was my sociology class. It was called like the black experience or something like that. So when you talk about turning over, you know, you know, this study too. So that was my experience. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I had to almost like make myself get into the history. But what, you know, the book, you know, that you're working on, right, that's some history I've lived through. And then as right. you talk about these, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to dig into that as a study of history. So, well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. You work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got at least one book sold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's not going to have trouble selling more. No, 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 I'm, I'm joking. But, uh, I, like, I, I can guarantee my mom and Doug. So we got three. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. get it too. I'll okay, get it too. Yeah, we got three. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Doug makes a good point about history in general wasn't taught in a sense like when people tell me oh I hate history I'm like you probably had a horrible teacher right yeah and that's right, the yeah. problem is changing the narrative of history and it's not a like I used to always tell my students in the beginning of the year we're not just going to talk about dead white men 
right. because that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. And so we would get into it, but going to what Doug was saying, what you're saying, Professor Jeffries, is it's not until people get to college do they appreciate it when, for me as a middle school teacher, I love it. And my family knows it, Doug knows it. There's so much more to history than what people tend to think it is. So we're hoping to change that narrative. And with everything that you're doing with teaching hard history and with all of the, you know, the little um, seminars and the little lectures that you're giving, it, it really is changing mindset. So I'm appreciative of your work as a historian myself, um, and I'm, I'm sure many other teachers are. So thank you, thank you. That's always a pleasure to talk to you. And like I told Doug when I found out that you'd be on my show, I was like fangirling. So um, <laughs> thank you again for being on the show. But we have two questions left that okay. we'd like to end up our show. So this yeah. is my personal question that I like to ask. So question for you is, which singer artist would you have perform an album about your life and why? And there's also a second question to that is, what would the title of your album be? But let's see what you got for us. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, have to, I have to go New York. Um, I have to go hip hop and I would okay. have to, I would have to go Nas. Oh, <laughs> very happy now. Cause Nas is not, Nas, Nas, Nas will connect it, right? Like yep. Nas, Nas will connect, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the experiences on the street, right? Hmm. Like, you know, having to negotiate and navigate that. Okay. Nas also, you know, you listen to some of Nas, Nas got some black power roots, right? I mean, so he's going to connect to the broader, so it ain't all silliness, right? And then, and then he has a lyrical flow, which is, which is, which is important, right? Like I appreciate that, right? Like that's, that's, that's that church, right? Like you gotta be able to, yep. you gotta be able to speak to the people. So, so I would go, I would, you know, I'm gonna have to text, text Nas on that one. I'm gonna see if he's busy. All right, all right. What would the title of your album be though? Now that, you know, that's, I don't know, man. I don't know. I might have to go Prince, just like a symbol or something. <laughs> like, I'll, like, I'll, just leave it, leave it sort of open because the story isn't over, right? Like, so right. Like, oh, I, like I don't know, that. I don't know what the final, you know, I don't know what that would, you know, a journey. I don't know. You, you know, we, we have to, I, I think that's yet, yet to be written, yet to be written. And so and before we do our last question, we do have our friend Vernon who says, we yes. want to read your book directly from you, not Amazon. So yeah. once you get that information out, we would love to share that with gotcha. the, our audience. Get it to our network. Yep. Yes. yes. So, okay. So we see that you, you like Nas and that makes, Doug, very happy. That's what I was about to say. So yeah, you got you got you have fans in a bear and me. Yes. There we go. Yes. So um, we open up our show. Yep. So we, we end up with a with a challenge. It's, uh, we call it the four by four. And mm -hmm. um we do like to honor hip hop um in our space. So if you uh look at the four pillars of hip hop, uh the graffiti art, the DJing, breaking, and uh the emceeing. Mm -hmm. So what we'd ask you as a guest, if you could just name uh one artists from each of those pillars that just resonates with you and connects with you. So of course you could choose Nas again, you want right. to choose a different MC, but just want to pose that to you as a challenge um, before, you know, we wrap things up this evening. Yeah. Huh. So let's start with the, with, with the DJ. Okay. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a fella who um, I was in college with, uh, who, who's still spinning today, DJ Tron, still down, mm. still down in Atlanta. Uh, you know, now, now there's, there's folk who are, you know, more more well known. Uh, but you, when you got 25 years, I mean, you can go, you know, you know, a, a cool herc if you want. Right. But, okay. You know, I'm gonna Herc's. go. With, I'm gonna go with DJ Tron. Right. Love it. Love it. It's, you know, that's a personal connection there. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was he was he was making he was making tapes for me when I was stepping. Right. So ah. you know, <laughs> we, got, we got personal connection. Personal. Very connection. nice. Um. So the break dancing, I mean, you know, old school, like crazy legs, right? Like, ah, old, old, <laughs> legendary. Like, legendary, right? Like old school. Maybe the I mean, second person to mention crazy legs. I mean, that's like, you know, the beginning of it all, right? Yeah. Like my yeah. brother and I were windbreakers, right? Like with cardboard. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Trying to do some seven and eight, you know, six or seven, eight years old, right? I mean, so we, so we had that. Um, you know, you know, hip hop, I, I would definitely, I, I would stick with, I would stick with Nas. I would stick with okay. Nas. Uh, I, I will concede, though, that the person who is the hip hop connoisseur by far is my brother. Okay. Like he does it. And people say, like, "Oh, you know, he quotes hip hop lyrics. You know, is that sort of just fashionable or trendy?" Like, nah, y'all don't understand. <laughs> like, he still has. Uh, like, it's not in his house, but you know how you you, you know how you leave your stuff back at your mama's house, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, he still has like lyric books. Right, like, <laughs> uh, like back in the day, you know, you know, yeah. you tried your stuff, right? I mean, so he's serious about it. Okay, that, right? we definitely okay. have him on the show so he could do this four by four for Doug and yeah, yeah, yeah. very happy. Right. Yeah. So, so that would that would be that would be that would be that would be. 
So I, I'm sticking with Nas, right? But, okay. But, you know, okay, no, I, actually, that's cheating a little bit because I, I named Nas earlier, right? Um, um, see, I, I have Big Daddy Kane. This is you know, mm -hmm. people can appreciate Big Daddy Kane. I don't think I don't think enough people need to. New York, New York roots, big time. Speak on that sign, and Brooklyn. Speak on that sign. So, yes. so I mean, <laughs> a couple, but this is also you know, it, it, it was funny because um, I remember. The, uh, Central Park Five, right? So mm -hmm. when they see us, you know, when they see us, uh, yep. which I just came out on Netflix, right? Powerful, yep. powerful. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the opening scene, like the very first scene, um, now Ava DuVernay, I don't know if people realize this, like Ava DuVernay is from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, she also had her own hip hop group. Oh, right? I didn't and, know that. Oh, she had her own hip hop group and she actually did a documentary um, you know, a couple years ago, and I, I, I want to call, I, I think it's called This Is Life. It's worth checking out. I've, show, I've shown it to my students about the sort of the conscious hip hop scene that was emerging in LA mm -hmm. that really had greater connections to mm -hmm. uh, New York, uh, but that was occurring at the same time as the sort of the gangster rap, right? So mm -hmm. you had, you know, you had the, you know, uh, NWA, but then you also had this conscious, this conscious rap coming out of LA. And, but at the very beginning, the very first scene um, when they're showing, you know, of 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 this is us, right? Do do you, do you do you recall? And I gotta ask y'all a question, right? Like, do y'all uh, do you recall? You may not. Do you recall the song that was playing? So this is 1989. I won't stop y'all. It was special ed. I got it made. Oh, I, like, I don't okay. know if y'all remember that, man. So I mean, this is a uh, beer. This is strictly New York, right? I mean, this is this is, but it's special ed. I got it made. Mm -hmm. And when 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 that play when i heard that i was like oh like she's done her homework right i mean because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. exactly that's what when was special ed, playing back then yeah 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 um, so that i got made late 90s I, I mean i think that that late 90s to early to late 80s to early 90s is, is, is the is the high point of hip-hop certainly yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. golden era i agree so. and, and and so the last one the four by four is is the you know is the artist right mm -hmm. so so I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with Hassan Jeffries. Like, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm, gonna go I'm, I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring. Now look, yes. that's, not, that's not because I was any good, right? Ain't, ain't nobody buying anything from Hassan Jeffries. But while my brother was doing his, you know, lyric notebook, uh -huh. I had my own tag notebook, right? Okay. And so I was doing, and again, I want anything, right? I mean, I want, but I mean that was part of the culture. That's what we yes. did, right? Like we were Is in that still lunch. like your mom's house. That's still at the mom's house, right? With the baseball cards, right? That ain't worth nothing. But you know, <laughs> it's, it's it's right there. But I mean, so I mean, all of it, like so. My friend DJ Tron, right? I mean, who's been spending for twenty years? I mean, that's because he was doing stuff when he was that's seven right. and eight, nine that's years right. old, right? Uh, and so he stuck with it as a hobby and as a career. Uh, but for for but but there's there's a million of us, right? Who whether mm -hmm. it was part of those four pillars had one that we just you know really became spoke mm -hmm. to us. Uh, and so for me, it was, you know, tagging and, and, and doing a little graffiti and the little stuff like that. I, I love how you included yourself. I don't think we've had a guest who. This is brilliant. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So the beer knows I'm, I'm, I'm floating now because mm -hmm. if you look at some past episodes, we had a couple struggles. But I'm right. going to tell you, September, brothers have made a comeback with the four by four. There we go. And there we go. Taking your time. And then I love DJ Tron. And he bookended. He had DJ Tron. Then he put Hassan Jeffries. And then he put some, <laughs> le some legends in the middle. And like you said, the, the culture, every, everything. We use Hassan's clip for like the spokesperson for the challenge. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of mad I couldn't get the uh, special ed reference. I do remember like the opening of of the um, that film, like it being steeped in that air, it made you yeah, feel like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's in the background. They just walking through, and I was like, oh, yep. when she hit that, I was like, man, they about to do it right. Yeah, yep. right. and I gotta look up that other film too. I, I was taking my notes. This is yeah, life. life. I was life. getting my notebook. Yeah, being those. Yeah, that's yes, that's a notebook. Keith Lewis, our friend, also says, "Professor, <laughs> cookout invite." <laughs> I, I think I'm bringing the coal for that one. That's what he told me. Charcoal. Appreciate the shared thoughts and experience, even though he's a be more dude, and he just mentioned Prince. He's a huge Prince fan. For you to there say that, you def definitely yeah, got. Yeah, so you made, you made his night. I appreciate yes. that. Yes. So you know, we hate to see you we hate to end this conversation because there's just so much more we want to talk about. Uh, we can talk to you for hours, but we appreciate Absolutely. your work. Uh, we appreciate you um, taking some time. Please check out Professor Jeffries also on Audible. He has great figures of the civil rights movement. 
teaching hard history. He also has his uh, other books coming out. So definitely when you do have that, let us know where people can order so we can skip the Amazon if they want. Um, yeah. And you know, we hope to have you again as a guest again on our show. Absolutely. Be a oh, thank come back. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the great conversation. Of course, thanks for the wonderful work that you do inside the classroom and outside of it. We appreciate it. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Time. Thank you very much. We appreciate you, brother. Thank You're you for welcome. your time. Thank you okay. for every, everything you brought to the space. Thanks, Thank man. you. Thanks. Thank You're you. Welcome. Take care. Yep. Take Bye -bye. care. I love it. I do. Wouldn't I be disappointed, yo? I know that. Wow. wow. So I'm, I must say this, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I talked about a beer's generosity, but if a beer tells you that you need to be checking somebody out, you got to check. I mean, it, that's money in the bank. I, I'm serious. Like Appreciate when a beer that. tells you you need to know this person. I mean, I, I must right, my man Keith. That's how I know Keith, right? Um, there you go. Love it, love it. But Keith, Vernon, good to see you all in the space. Um, those are my brothers for sure. We appreciate um, it. And I'm just, again, I'm, I'm feeling. I admit, um, we used to do hour shows. You know, we're getting. A, I could sit here and just listen to mm -hmm. Professor Jeffries all evening. I mean, just, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I can get some online classes, take something with him. But, hey. but like you said, he, he's got several ways to teach right. what he knows. And I definitely I'm looking forward to this book coming out. Mm -hmm. Podcast is amazing. Um, but yeah, please, for all of our, our viewers, mm -hmm. our audience members, definitely check out uh, Twitter. You mentioned social media. Um, yes. But Professor Jeffries is, is certainly um, someone we want to get to know more about. So uh, let's keep up with his, yeah. his outstanding work. Okay. So check us out on our YouTube channel, Real Talk, Our Space, of course. And uh, next week we still continue with our theme. Brother's going to work it out. So who's our guest next week, Doug? So next week we have Kevin Shindell. Um, I love the and picture of him, by the way. I'm about to say, he's probably got one of the best. And it's funny, he's like, is this picture okay? Is it okay? <laughs> Um, so so okay. Kevin Shindell, maybe you don't know him now. Is somebody you, you want to know. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, keeping it personal, local, immediate, met Kevin in 1986. We were freshmen wow. in okay. high school. So Kevin and I go that far back. And that then, back. oh, yeah. And then um, when I was changing careers, we actually ran each other at our high school reunion. And he invited me to his classroom to watch him teach. And that's really what convinced me, like, I do want to take this, this path um, to teaching. So... Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Kevin does some very some 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 work um, that we're very excited to share with with our audience and talk about next week. So please come back and join us when I guess will be Kevin Shindell yes. um, here in Real Talk Our Space. So um, yes, we always give a shout out to our music that was produced by Corey Carter. You can follow him on Absolutely. Twitter, Carter Teach, and he's also busy with his new baby girl talk That's about right. the, mystery, the same thing with them so i hope they're they're doing well and again follow us on youtube or if you need anything you could also watch all of our the website to the website ultraconsulting.com forward slash real talk and this was another great show um i enjoyed it i know i hope the audience enjoyed it leave us a comment a like subscribe and hopefully we will see you again next week yes all hopefully right. all right take care good night, good night. bye Thank you.